Hello and welcome to episode 1287 of The Sleeper and the Bust. It is Monday, April 22nd. I'm your host, Paul Sporer, joined this morning by Justin Mason. Justin, good morning, sir. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Had a nice weekend, plenty of baseball, and uh, ready to get the week started. How about yourself? I went to bed before midnight every Again? day for the last three days. You are a changed man. Actually, I mean, I guess the last four days, right? Like, I mean. What is spurring this? Um, I respect I, it. I think it's just luck. I, I okay. think that's it. And like, I feel like good. Like I had like, I had like the link to you for, for doing yeah. a recording, like you were on. early this morning. Like I already set my post for my chat later. Like, uh, I, I'm going to go on a walk after my chat Love it. exercising. Like, it's like, I don't know. Like it's, it's, I don't know what's going on. It Who won't knew last. sleep had benefits. Yeah. It won't last. I'll, I'll be up to like four o'clock this morning. But, no, don't do it. Stick with it. I've been sticking with it. I've, I've been. Well, the er, problem early. on Mondays, I I I record until like usually ten o'clock at night, and then yeah. I got to write multiple articles. So like, that's I ain't the getting part. to bed. Yeah. That so plus, I'm I'm part. on like my twentieth rewatch of the West Ring, and I've got like two episodes left. That's so. at least twentieth for you. Yeah. Yeah. So twelve of them have been just in our friendship. Yeah, I can't even yeah. imagine. Yeah, at least before yeah. that. Um, all right. Well, I'm glad you're getting some good sleep. That that pleases me. Um, I, I myself have been less of a night owl and uh, I, I don't mind it. It was always a problem because I am a night owl and an early bird. I like waking up early. Oh, but see, I like I, staying up late. I hate waking up early, but I have kids now who have to get to school in the morning. Yeah. And so uh, I do. Uh, and I'm getting older. So like I have to do things like pee. Yes. Uh, that I, you know, can't God, just hold I on to. always, and this is like such a fucking old man conversation, but I got to pee, you know, overnight, most nights. And I just always hope that it's close to time to wake up. I hate <laughs> when it's like three or four o'clock. I'm like, oh my God. Cause if it's like five 45 or something, I'll just stay up. I'm like, that's fine. Cause I get up at like six ten anyway. So anyway, uh, the old man hour Monday morning overshare. That's right. The Monday morning overshare here on our restroom breaks overnight. Uh, we got some things to talk about. We want a little bit of news that could actually be good for this player. And then we're going to get into some shallow league cutter holds. So we're looking at 10s and 12s. Shallower formats, probably three outfielders for most of them is what we're thinking here. One catcher for the one catcher that we're going to speak about, one catcher league. And we got to see if we're making some moves on these guys, Justin, because we've talked about it millions of times. This could be a weakness for us that we don't make the moves quick enough in some of these formats. Sometimes we struggle in the 10s and 12s because we are so 15 team brained that we hang on to guys where it makes sense in a 15, but it doesn't in a 10 or 12 because there's several similarly talented guys that you got to go pick up a hot hand or somebody who's at least trending the right way. So we'll get into that. But first, I want to talk about Yariel Rodriguez. Interesting pitcher for the Blue Jays. Might be moving to the bullpen soon. It's not 100% confirmed, but it's it's very likely. But he might be shifting into the multi-inning role that we've had right now as a starter. But it's been the front end. It's actually not been great. You love the 13 Ks in seven and two thirds, three and two thirds for one outing, four innings for the other. But it's at the front end of the game. You can't get a dub. So give me the good ratios there and the strikeouts. But if he does this same thing after a starter, even if it's two to three innings consistently, but it's two, maybe three times a week, if it's spread out properly, is that not better for Yariel Rodriguez if he goes to the bullpen, given that he's not going to be a five-plus inning guy? Yeah, absolutely. Like This is best-case scenario. Uh, I was regretting spending... $69 on him in Tau nice. Wars. Uh, and because I was like, oh no, now he's he's never gonna get a win. Like they're only gonna let him go three or four innings. And uh so if he moves to the bullpen and becomes like a team guy with uh Baden Francis or Francis Manoa. Oh, with Manoa, is that that that's that what they're saying? Yeah, they're saying well then he'll mean. never have an opportunity to win for a win because he'll be down by eight runs by the time he gets in. <laughs> but he'll pitch the next four innings. So <laughs> At, at least he'll, he'll come in chance. halfway through the first. Yeah, it'll end up. They'll look like starts in the end. <laughs> yeah, I, I know things have not gone well for him, but that, that was the name they mentioned. I'm not saying that that's exactly who who it'll be, but you know, it's clear that 
he Yariel Rodriguez is a f- three to four inning guy right now, and as such, that just doesn't make for a great start. Now I think he's still going to get the start this week at, Can- at Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Um, and then next week he would have lined up for a two step against Kansas City again, and then at Washington. I don't know if that will be the time when he shifts. Bottom line is, whether you're starting him or not, I'm hanging on to Yariel Rodriguez. I want to kind of see how this plays out because if he does get into that Ryan Yarbrough role uh, from yesteryear, then I'm very intrigued. And so I'm going to ride this out with Yariel and kind of see where it goes with him. And it sounds like you are too. Yeah. For okay, sure. cool. So stick with Yariel Rodriguez. There could be some uh, some benefits in the future if he isn't starting, which is usually a weird thing to say, but given that he is only going to be three to four innings, this is a positive. All right, shall we cut or hold? We got to make some decisions here, Justin. Uh, some of these guys are getting to the point where it's like, man, how do I keep running this guy out? I have limited spots. My, my team isn't performing. Do I need to chase something better? And we've got some guys to talk about. Let's start with the Cardinals. And uh, at least early on, I had this team wrong. I thought they'd be better this year. I thought they wouldn't have two years down in a row. Last year, we talked about how it was really the pitching and the hitting was actually still pretty good. Uh, This year, it's everything. The pitching is still pretty rough outside of a couple guys. Our boy Lance Lynn has a nice ERA. Sonny Gray has been excellent in his three starts. The bullpen, I think, has actually been pretty good. So it's definitely not the pitching. The hitting is the problem. Goldie looks terrible. He's not on this list. Neither of us are touching Goldie, right? No, not I even, mean, I, not even. I'm, close, I'm not. Personally. I'm not ready. To, I am definitely worried about Goldie. Like the you know last time I checked, like the underlying skills are definitely declining. Like they're we're, they're bad, but I'm not close. To, I'm I'm a month away from cutting him personally. Yeah, I think I'm probably around there. Um, He's a 255 Babbitt. There are other skills there too. Again, I always try to stress not just using Babip as like he's contributing to it. Let's just say, right? It's not just happening to him. The hit the hit rates are worse, like the hard hit rates and all that sort of stuff. So there are reasons to be concerned on on Goldie, but we're not in the cut zone yet. No, we might be with a couple guys though that you'd be surprised to hear. Let's start with Jordan Walker. Got a lot of chatter about Jordan Walker in my Twitch stream this morning, going over box scores and talking up guys. The tough part, and this is exactly the kind of guy that we're talking about, a guy that we would normally hold in 15s because you want to be patient with somebody who has upside and what are you really going to get that's that much better off the waiver wire. In a 12 or a 10, there's tons of Jordan Walkers out there and a lot of them are performing better. And now he's losing playing time, playing just two of the last four games. What are we doing with Jordan Walker? He's batting low in the lineup, losing PT, and playing horribly when he does play. Do we have to move on from Jordan Walker? I understand if you do. I, I'm not quite ready to do that. I think the concerning part for me is to those, you know, to those four games that you mentioned were against lefties that he sat. Uh, and so I do worry that he's kind of falling into a platoon situation. Uh, he's right-handed. He should be facing the lefties. Oh yeah. Oh wait, I'm sorry. The versus righties. Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Two sorry. two of them were against righties. That's right. right. So that means so, he's, he could be falling into a short side short platoon. side platoon, which is really really scary for a guy like Jordan Walker because then you have to drop him for sure. Like if he's only, if he's not going to play against right-handed pitching, uh, he's in a lot of trouble. Um, the underlying skills say like he should be better than this. Like I'm not saying he should be great or anything, but like. Mm-hmm. He's making around league average contact, maybe a little bit less. He still hit the ball really, really hard. He's putting the ball on the ground, I think, a little bit too much. It needs to be some elevation. But I think ultimately he's going to be okay. I just don't know. One, I don't think we're going to get that breakout that maybe some people thought we might get because uh, he was a riser during kind of the end of draft season. Yeah. Um, it, but I think he'll be fine in the end as long as the Cardinals stick with him. The problem is I don't know if the Cardinals stick with him. I don't I'm know sorry. if the Cardinals are doing I'm- I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was looking up one thing, so I had zoned out for a quick second. Did you mention the 13% barrel rate for Walker? I did not, but I, I did mention like the underlying still is fine. He's hitting the ball hard. Yeah. yeah so like making around league average contact in the zone. And I just to me the I line think, drive rate's five percent. Here's the thing. Yeah. And this is again getting to the core of the shallow versus deep. You're using careful language to point out that you still like him and you believe that he can make some moves. Totally agree. 
just because you cut him in a 10 and 12 doesn't mean you can't circle back around. Like it's not admitting him. Like, don't be too proud to do that. Who gives a shit? If he is then the hot hand, come back around and get Jordan Walker. The reason I'm open to cutting is because he's losing the PT. He's batting low in a lineup that isn't performing. Let me go get somebody that's playing well right now. They might not last and I might come right back to Walker. I'm okay possibly losing out on him even as somebody I like though. So I am making the move in tens and twelves for Jordan Walker. I'm, I'm cutting him. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I think that ultimately you should pro you should move quicker. And, and the hard part is he's really, really struggling against fastballs. Like he's struggling. against yeah. velocity, And that to me is like, maybe he does need to go back down a little bit and I'd get Pajes for him. Andy Pajes with the Dodgers. Like he's going to have some availability in shallow leagues. He was picked up yeah. a bunch in the main event this week. Most picked up there move. in the main event. Yep. Picked up in all 57 leagues. I'd make that move. Um, you know, will your Bray you speaking of a guy that I circled back around on, I cut him one week, picked him up the very next will week. Bray, the same guy. We talked about him yesterday. His, his skills are not good. Like his, like the underlying skills, which is not good. Will your Bray. Like that. This is, and it's a hot hand thing. You ride it, I guess, for right now. But like, like there are some people who spent like three hundred bucks on him. I wouldn't have spent that, day. but I, I disagree bad, that the underlying skills aren't good. What? Enlighten me. Give me a sec as I pull up his page. But yeah, uh, we're talking about William Bray with the Red Sox, who's falling into some more playing time, batting in the middle of the order, two ninety, three ninety, four forty slash line. I love when it's all rounded on the zeros there with the slash line. Um, 15% walk rate, 29% K rate, you know, swings and misses yeah, a lot. 50 or 15% swing and strike rate. Uh, he's making uh, 80% zone contact, which is about 5% below league average. Uh, I think he, he's got a, you know, 280 uh, average, but a 196 XBA. He is getting extremely lucky right 406 now. Babbitt, yep. Yeah, I mean, just really, really lucky. Um, now on the plus side, everybody in Boston is hurt. Like everybody in Boston. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I think the playing time is safe for right now, but Tyler and supposed to come back, uh, potentially tomorrow. Uh, I don't, like I said, has I he think been out for 10 days. That concussion happened. It's, it's, uh, seven oh, days, seven days, seven days, seven days, yeah. seven days. My fault, my fault, my fault, my fault. So, uh, and he, the, you know, it was retroactive to when he got hurt. So, correct. Correct. Um, yeah, I, now, Rob Ref Snyder, there's no he has no business being an everyday player. So, like, I think they should be able to still find a bright new time. I just think kind of this performance is kind of built on a little bit of a house of straw. It's going to get blown over. Okay. I mean, I, I'm not going to fully disagree with that. I think he started off, like, really poorly in those first, you know, 10 or so games. And I would wonder, without having dug in to see for myself like how much the skills you know that what we've seen to this point are dragged down by that like has the hard hit rate gone up and if it hasn't then all your points still remain i like william brady so i'm i'm biased toward him that's where my bias is i would pick him up for jordan walker right now i'll ride the hot hand i yeah i mean i don't have a problem if if that's what you want to do like as like a short-term play because like you said you can always go back to walker or walker picks it up or go to someone else if Abreu fails. You know, yeah. just looking over like since like the 10th of April, right? On Abreu. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that time, you know, he's hitting 353, 463, 588 with that one home run and four stolen bases. So pretty much like the majority of his good work. Um, you know, hard hit rate is under 40%. So it's in line with his with his season mark. So it's yeah. not better there. Okay. The that's swing fair. strike rate is still 14%. Zone contact is around 81%. So, I mean, it's a tad bit better than the overall line, but it's still, again, not good and doesn't like project out to like being like, hey, this guy has made a big change or something here in the last totally. 10 days or so. 49% hard hit rate last year, though, in mm -hmm. his sample. So we've seen him be, be better. 85 plate appearances, not much to go on. The swing and miss is going to be there for William Bray. I like yeah. the power and I like that he's running. I think there's more power to be had. I like that he's running. I'll ride this right now. For me, I really like him in deeper for, leagues. For me, the one thing I like about William Bray is that he walks and has. Yes. Right? Like, so you can get that, those steals even when the, the Babbitt starts coming yeah. down because it's going to. I totally yeah, agree with that. 
406, and he's not doing anything, William Abreu, to maintain a 406. Yeah. Bottom line, though, it might not be Abreu. It might be somebody else. I'm moving on from Walker in the shallow leagues as somebody who's really liked him in the past. I'm probably moving on from his teammate as well, but I'm a little bit more interested in hanging on to Nolan Gorman, who's next on our list here. At least he's showing some of the power. He does have three homers. You know, you're getting something there, but it's a 39% K rate up from 32 last year. The walk rate has tanked from 11 to 7. Babip's down. Like everything's down. Hard hit rate is down 18 points. Barrel rate's down six points. It's rough with Nolan Gorman right now. I don't see any way you're holding in a 10, and I'm probably not holding in a 12 right now. What say you of Nolan Gorman? Uh, yeah, the skills are really bad, but the skills have always kind of been really bad on Gorman. <laughs> um, he just the power the hasn't hard. been, though. Yeah, like, not he the just power. Hits the ball. He just hits the ball hard. Like, dude hits the ball hard. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when he makes contact, his loud contact, but, like, he is got, like, a 73% zone contact, which is, like, really atrocious. We're, that, those are Joey Galloway numbers, yeah. uh, which is not what you want to see uh, from a guy like uh, Gorman. Uh, he is platooning at this point. Like he's not playing against lefties. Uh, I I don't have a problem necessarily moving on. Just know that at some point he will go on a hot streak where you know he hits like you know four home runs in a week, and you're it's like, another oh type of no, guy you can come back to. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Looking at some sure. of the guys on our player radar that uh, have some lower roster rates, this was a guy who was a huge pickup yesterday, and like I knew he was doing well, but I did not think people would be going bananas for your boy Luis Garcia Jr. with the Nats he was getting triple digit bids like he was he was up there um what do you think about Luis Garcia versus Nolan Gorman I think it's really really annoying that uh Luis Garcia starts to have like some sort of weird breakout the year I don't track him anywhere. in fairness he's 24 you probably should have stuck with him yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely should have stuck with him. But five uh, steals, a homer, three seventeen average so far. We'll see if it holds. It's a little bit light fantasy wise, um, and obviously, if you need power, that's not the move you make. But if you're just looking for a better player, then I can get behind Garcia for Gorman. What about? Um, let's see here. What about Blaze Alexander? Are you doing that one? He's riding hot. He's blazing. <laughs> I might like. I think. I think that uh, I mean, he did leave the game with an injury yesterday, but I think it was just that's like right. a hamstring cramp or something like that. So I don't think it's super uh, super serious or anything. Um, I think it. If, yeah, if, you were right. If, that, if you need power, I probably just stick with Gorman because I do think Gorman has much better power. But if you're looking for batting average or just more consistent kind of production, uh, if you're looking because I think Blaze Alexander is mostly an accumulator. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's not going to hit high up in that Diamondbacks lineup, so it's even tougher to accumulate when you're not going to hit super high regularly. So uh, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think in a 10 or 12, like I'm looking for a guy with a just bigger upside. Yeah, I think that makes I think that makes sense. I, I would probably be looking for that too. Let me see if I can find some better names. All oh, okay, sorry trying to manipulate this uh, Yahoo list here, and I'm trying to find all the available players, or all the players, not just available players. All right, looking at roster rates that come in under 70. All right, would you go for Ahmed Rosario on a hot hand situation? Yes, He's absolutely. playing every day. Okay. He's playing every day. He's triple eligible. Uh, well guy, we, we we talked about him yesterday on on the uh, the Fab podcast as a guy that I would target uh, okay. in my tens and twelves because uh, Ahmed Rosario has always just been a good hitter. Like he's just Solid always player. like he's he's a terrible defender, which causes that's what's always hurt him. Yep. Uh, but like he has always just been a very good hitter. Uh, super aggressive, so will be cold streaks at times, but ultimately like there's power, there's speed. Tampa Bay seems to play him every day. They're just hiding him defensively in different spots. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Ahmed Rosario for me, like it, I would drop uh, Gorman, no problem for for Ahmed Rosario. And one last one, Edward Julian had the two homer game. Mm -hmm. It's been all right. He's still batting at the top of the order. 
He batted, he did play against the last lefty they faced, batted ninth, but at least he was in the lineup. Taking his walks, his, his average isn't anything to speak of. 179, he has a 216 Babbitt, but his core skills are still there, and he has the four homers. Would you rather him or Gor uh, Julian or Gorman? Uh, I think I'd rather have Julian. I think I would, too. I believe, I, I, I believe in him to be better from here forward. Like, there's nothing really in the profile to me that says that Julian should be this bad other than a 216 Babbitt. Correct. Like I think he is just getting unlucky right now. Like, it, and yeah, this is when you look at it. You say, "Is the Babbitt because of all the way poor ways that they're hitting, or is it bad luck?" And I think with yeah. Julian, it's more bad luck than anything else. So the fact that they haven't the moved him out of the lineup or the uh, the uh, leadoff spot tells me a lot about how the team feels about it too. Fully agree. Same case with this next guy. As we jump back to Tampa Bay after talking about Ahmed Rosario, and we go to their leadoff hitter, Yandy Diaz. Now, the thing is, in a, in a shower league, I think there is some question about it because he doesn't have, you know, a bevy of 20-plus homer seasons. He doesn't steal. So he really is batting average dependent. He has just one homer, 10 ribbies, 221 average, but a 256 Babbitt. Uh, hard hit rate is down seven points. Barrel rate down seven points. So there's some factors there on the ground a ton, which is normal, but really high right now at 63% ground ball rate. Is he going to come out of this and, you know, go on a multi-hit run the way these types of guys usually do? And you got to hold Yandy Diaz or would you be looking to make a move? I don't have a problem making a move. I do think that Diaz will end up being fine. Maybe he's not a 300 hitter again, uh, but like, I still think like 280 and teens home runs, is probably yep. what you're going to see. The problem is in a 10 team league, especially like that doesn't move the needle. Like you can find that those guys like teens home runs at 280 batting average, like doesn't do much for me, especially when especially it's coming from homers. your CI. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, or, or even like your first or third base, if you're playing in Yahoo. Right. So yep. like, you know, a lot, a lot of these shallower leagues now don't even have an MICI. So, I don't have a problem moving on, but I do think he will be better. So, like, I'm not like in a you know 15 team league or even a lot of 12s. I'm not like running to cut him for somebody else because I think he will deliver you kind of what you're looking for. I just don't think. I think there were was some thought pe thoughts from people uh, coming into draft season like, oh, this is just the you know the next step, and then there's going to be another step after this. And I I don't think that's the case. Like I don't no. there's not much in the profile that tells me like right now I think he's just trying to swing his way out of it. He's swinging more outside the zone, swinging more inside the zone. Like he is just trying to swing his way out of it and I think he will. But yes. ultimately like for what? Like why in a 10 team league, yeah, you should probably be cutting and moving on. 10 team I can get behind it. 12s and deeper. I think I got to just ride Yandi out through here. Um in a 10 team Let's look at some second or some third baseman that might have like 70% roster rate at Yahoo, which has a lot of 12s. Like, would you go get Oswaldo Cabrera if he's uh, still sure. available? Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, Cabrian Hayes? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think I can do that in, in, in the tens, but everything else, I think you just got to ride it with Yandi. Again, he'll have a hit barrage. The batting average will be back up, and, you, and you'll and you wonder why you ever panicked. So for the most part, I'm holding. I'm not dying to make a move. And even in some tens, you can hold if batting average is your issue and just kind of let him be there because you, you do risk getting uh, you know whipsawed back and forth trying to chase guys in batting average uh, and always catching the tail end of streaks. So you got to be careful there. All right, now here's what I wanted to talk about. And listen, I like this guy. I actually thought, hey, don't draft the uh, the premium version of him. Take the discounted version of Oni uh, of Ellie De La Cruz in the form of O'Neill Cruz, right? By the time draft season was finishing, they weren't that far apart in ADP. It was still more expensive to get um, Ellie De La Cruz, but O'Neill Cruz was not cheap at that point. And everyone's ready to take their victory laps on Ellie De La Cruz. And I get it. He's been electric, man. Just absolutely looking like he did when he first came up. Hitting 306, six homers, 10 steals, 
14% walk rate for Ellie is incredible too. O'Neill Cruz is the other side of this coin though. 40% K rate, 7% walk, three homers, two steals, but a 209 average despite a 326 Babbitt. But he just has so much swing and miss. So again, I even said with my Ellie De La Cruz negativity that I wanted to be wrong. And I, I'm not lying about that. It will be fine if he has this excellent season and y'all throw my busts article back in my face all summer. Cool. That means we're watching a really, really fun season and I'll eat that. But you can't just ignore that O'Neill Cruz is very much the same type of guy and he is showing the exact negative of this profile. Just because one sample of it works doesn't mean that it's not prudent to still fade this type of volatility. I guess the it's the risk reward. How much do you want to risk to possibly get the LA reward? And some people were saying, hey, I could get a first round guy here, but it's a second round pick. That's yeah, the, you can get a first round guy all throughout the second round. Like I just yeah. So O'Neill, what are we doing here? Are we moving on at all in shallow leagues with the forty percent K rate and seven percent walk, or has he done enough to kind of keep you interested? I mean, let in honor of the NFL draft being on Thursday mm -hmm. and my Washington Washington Commanders ruining some poor kid's career <laughs> uh, with the number two overall pick here on Thursday. Uh, I'm going to invoke a little Denny Green. He is who we thought he is, and we let him off the hook. Like, this is O'Neill Cruz. If you drop him, you will regret it because next week he will hit four home runs or five home runs. And, like, True. this is the volatility of O'Neill Cruz. Like You're kind of in for the ride, then, is what you're saying. Yeah. Like, close your eyes and just look at the numbers at the end because... You know, the numbers at the end will be like, okay, that was a little scary. Maybe I didn't get the batting average I wanted, but like the power will be there. Like, he, you know, he's like, he's going to be fine, I think. Like, he's going to be kind of what you drafted him for ish. I, I, there was a reason why I wasn't drafting either O'Neill Cruz or Ellie. One, I didn't want to deal with the volatility, mm -hmm. but two, like, I don't really. I believe they were both being overdrafted. Now, Ellie may turn out to be, you know, I might be wrong on that. Um, and we did get a lot of heat during draft season. I haven't gotten any since draft season. Feel free to tweet at me and I'll ignore you at Justin Mason FWFB. Um, but like their underlying numbers are not that dissimilar. Like they, they both have almost the, like, let's see. Uh, O'Neill Cruz has a 13.8% swing and strike rate. Uh, Ellie De La Cruz is a 14.3% swing and strike rate. Ellie De La Cruz has a 79% uh, in zone contact. Um, O'Neill Cruz has a 78.5% in zone contact. Uh, That's what I'm saying, man. I think the, there are two real big differences other than just like the production numbers. Obviously, if you look at you know what Ellie has done in terms of 10 home runs. And uh, six stolen bases and a three out of six batting average. You're like, oh, there's a huge difference. To me, the biggest difference has nothing to do with any of that outside of the 14% walk rate um, is somewhat supported by a huge drop in O swing for Ellie De La Cruz. Yeah. I, I do, and probably also they're getting more nervous with him, and so he's not just mm -hmm. chasing because they're pitching him more carefully. That is very encouraging there with the walks for Ellie. So, like, I do think that Ellie can keep this up to some respect because of that walk rate. Now, will he keep up the batting average? No, the batting average is going to crater. I mean, even just, like, running with, you know, this 400 Babbitt, like, his his XBA is 255 right now. Now, I could live with a two If he's a 255 hitter and he gets you oh, God, yes. 25 home runs and 45 stolen bases, like... At that's At a first, least. <laughs> yeah, that's like that's like a first round pick, right? Like uh you're gonna be stoked with that. Uh, but like there will be some cratering, and there's gonna be months where he like he hits like 207 uh and is really really struggling. And on the flip side, like O'Neill Cruz will have a massive freaking month at some point too. So like like if you are running a victory lap one way or the other on either of these guys, like you're a goof, you know, 
yeah, jog a little slowly because things yeah. are gonna uh, things are gonna change, and you're gonna want to like you're like that guy walk against the, the freeze. Yeah, when yeah. he was hyping mm-hmm. everybody up, and then yeah, he gets exactly. past and then falls down. And I agree. I'm not moving off O'Neal. If I can't, if I jumped on the O'Neill ride, this is what I was saying about Hunter Green on the pitching side. You sign up for a particular ride, then ride the fucking ride. Yeah. And that does include this with O'Neill. I just wanted to bring him up to kind of talk about these two and show the juxtaposition of the of this profile and how it can work and not work. But I agree. If I signed up for the O'Neill Cruise experience, I'm gonna ride with it. Um you know, he is coming off a fully missed season, essentially, by nine games. It, those of you in trade leagues, though, like, like go trade for O'Neill Cruz. Like, someone oh, may yeah, be get a freaking discount. out. Like, yes. if you can now, there's sometimes you're just not going to get a discount. Like, I... No, if there's just, somebody like us... Yeah, I just traded for Spencer Strider in the Sleeper in the Bus Dynasty League, and I got zero discount. Like, yeah. I got, like, I just said, okay, you know, it was like J-Ram... And Jorge Soler for Strider and uh, a couple of prospects. That's uh, still so uh, Strider Striderian prices. Yeah, like I'm fine. still playing paying full freight for a guy who's not going to pitch, you know, for a full season until 2026. And but. I'm not entirely sure I wouldn't pay relatively full price for O'Neill, but try to get the discount. Yeah, absolutely. And then just see where it's at because there is good work coming. Stay the course with him. You signed on for this ride. We can also, revisit in June. This is why you do not draft these guys in head-to-head leagues. That they can be so killer. In Roto, you just look up at the end of the year and you see what the stats yes. are. You yeah. ride the waves. In head-to-head, like you're saying, they can just decimate you week in, yeah. week out. And then they're going to win you a week, but do they lose you more weeks than they win mm-hmm. you? That's the tough part. So yeah. you got to stay the course with O'Neill Cruz. Enjoy the ride with Ellie. He's been wonderful. He'll probably have a downturn at some point. Although if this new walk rate's real, maybe his downturns aren't nearly as severe as they were last season when we you saw him You won't be really lacking for stolen bases at least. Exactly, because he'll be getting on base and we know that uh, Ellie, every time he's on, he's going to go, go, go. Yeah. Now, if you can get you to put down your cup of bath water real quick that you're sipping over there and talk about your boy, George Springer. That's such an old school joke about drinking <laughs> George Springer's bath water. But I had to put him on the list, even if it's only for you to tell people to calm down. I will say the plate skills are still excellent. Strikeout rate's actually down six points to 12%. Walk rate's up five to 14%. So those are two positives. 221 Babbitt is really holding things down. Two homers, three steals. Are we worried about Springer? Or are we going out and buying in a similar situation to the Cruz thinking like, hey, he'll get better. Where you at on your boy, George Springer? Yeah, I'm buying on Springer. I'm still drinking the bath water. <laughs> X- XBA is 273. He's making league average zone contact. He's actually making more contact out of zone this year, uh, which means he's you know at least fouling off pitches. Uh, or actually poking those in, into play. So uh, I I have no concerns. He actually has his highest XBA since the 2020 season uh, or the 2019 season, if you don't want to count 2020. So, like, yeah. things actually should be much better. Uh, this, you know, and he's still hitting for power, still stealing bases. Uh, I have no no concerns on George Springer. Like, this is, this is a great buy-low situation. If someone drops him and pick him up, I am not dropping him in any league. No, I'm not either. And again, I basically put him on the list so that uh, we could reinforce people to stay the course with George Springer. I'm sticking with him. I love that the plate skills are are rock solid. Again, markedly better even. I look at a 9% homer to fly ball in the 221 BABIP. And with everything else, I think he's been unlucky. So we're rocking XBA if you're if you're big on XBA 273 to his 210 average, and even the uh, X slug is up 70 points versus his regular 309 to 379. Stay the course with George Springer, no problems there. What about Jonathan India, a guy that you know he's had he's had a ride already, right? Like season's just getting going, but between the off season and now, it's just been such a whirlwind where it was like, okay, he needs to get traded. They have too many guys. Then guys started dropping like flies. Started with the Noel V. Marte suspension and then injuries galore. Okay, now he's locked into playing time. He's he's leading off. This Cincinnati team is good. If he leads off every day, that's positive. Well, now he's hitting 174, 326, 232 with a 20% K rate and a 16% walk rate. I love that. Is he being too passive, perhaps? What's going on with Jonathan India? Are we buying in or are we cutting in shallower formats? 
he's being too passive. That's exactly you absolutely nailed it because like he his swing percentage inside the zone has dropped eight percentage points. Uh, like in his swing percentage overall has dropped six and a half points. Like he's just not swinging enough. Uh, he's making elite zone contact. And when I say okay. elite zone contact, we're talking about like Luis Arise type level. Oh. 96.4% oh. zone contact. So like when he is swinging inside the zone, like he's making good contact. We absolutely I, love that for India. Yeah. Like he's, he's swinging outside the zone under 20% of the time. Swinging strike rate is 4% right now. Okay. Uh, like the power or like the, the exit velocity is down a little bit, but not like a massive amount. Like I think he's just being a little bit too patient. We're seeing it in that 16% walk rate. Mm -hmm. I think Jonathan Indy is going to be absolutely fine. Like I, like I think this is a, like, so last year, my first year when I was working at fantasy pros, like I did a weekly, like buy low, sell high. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't do it again this year. I, I passed it off to someone else just because I was tired about writing about the same effing guys every <laughs> week. Until like, they finally he came one came week, up. one week apart wasn't long enough for the article. Yeah. Like it just was like, like I was like, all right, sell high on Charlie Morton, buy low on George Springer, sell high on Charlie Morton. Buy that low feels on like an every other week yeah. article to really yeah. get some time in between things. So, Maybe even a once a month article, to be honest. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I pass it off, and I'm, I'm doing the the main event uh, fab kind of uh, recap article instead this year. Uh, but if I was going to be doing that this year, Jonathan India would be at the top of my list right now. I think this is a huge buy low. He's still leading off again for that great uh, offense in that fantastic park. I think he's going to be absolutely fine as long as he's healthy. Health has always been the issue. When he was scratched yesterday, I was like, oh no, but it was just like the flu or something like that. So. Uh, I think Jonathan Mio is a really, really good buy low. Like, I'm not dropping him yet. I'm not. Uh, and if someone drops him, I will run to the waiver wire and pick him up. I think I'm with that. Um, he wasn't somebody I've been following a ton this year because I, I, I don't have him anywhere. But digging in here as we just did and kind of see how everything actually looks pretty solid outside of the passivity, which can be fixed, right? Just start. Yeah. I mean, it's not as easy as just start swinging more. Obviously, you want to swing at good pitches, but we like and trust Jonathan India's ability to discern those good pitches. He's just spitting on some of them right now. And it's like, hey, attack. And yeah. uh, there could be some positivity there in that great team, great lineup, uh, great ballpark, lots of things there. So we're buying Springer and Jonathan India. What about this next guy? It's always tough to move off of players from, uh, you know, lineups that are the best or among the best in the league. And so James Outman, you've been giving away a piece of the Dodgers lineup, but he's sputtering a bit. The strikeouts are always a part of his game, and the BABIP's down to 238. He struck out 32% last year. It's at 31% this year. Two homers, a steal. It's been a slow start for James Outman. Are you moving off of him in shallow leagues, or do you have enough signs to kind of stay the course with him? I I tried to like warn people that like James Outman. Why didn't you was, warn me? I did warn you. We had conversations about this. Did we? Somebody uh, looked that up. I don't know if I was warned <laughs> properly. Uh, I like that him. like like this is part of the profile. Like yes. it's and what happened last year was we got like the amazing start with James yes. Outman, and then everybody ignored when he went through slumps. No, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think, because I think it goes the other way. I was impressed by the fact that he pulled out of the slump. That's and he'll what, pull out of this one too, but then he'll but go back into another back in. one. But that's know? okay. So then this goes back to the Roto versus head-to-head. -head. Because yeah. yeah, 991 OPS in, in April for James Outman. Then couldn't could barely crack 550 for the next two months. Like, it yeah. was bad. Guarantee he was cutting a bunch of shallow leagues. But then 904, 890, and even the 775 in September is not eye-popping, but it came with six homers, 11 ribbies, and 17 runs. So that's still really good. So he he's closed just, brilliantly. Yeah, he's just starting slow this year. The, and my warning to people was what is kind of starting to happen, which was if he starts off slow, will the Dodgers wait around for him? And what we're seeing is now Andy Paez come up, 
Like, is Outman going to play every single day? He's not playing against lefties right now. Like, Missed the last it, three lefties, yep. At least he's a, a pretty darn good defender, and I think yeah. that alone keeps him kind of uh, in the lineup on the strong side of the platoon. But, like, there was risk to James Outman that I don't think people were factoring in. One of the reasons why I loved him last year but I wasn't drafting him this year was that volatility and being – like, if you're volatile and you're playing on – the Pittsburgh Pirates, right? Like they don't have a lot of options. They don't have the depth to go and say, you know, O'Neill Cruz, you're sitting all, you know, yeah. half the time, you know, but the Dodgers do the Dodgers, like they fabricate people in factories and like all of a sudden, like AI is playing, you know, right field for them. So like the only uh, positive, well, I don't want to say positive because I'm not rooting for these guys to be negative, but Enrique Hernandez and Chris Taylor, have been garbage. horrendous yeah and so Pajes is up but he's only like filling in for hayward right now so again outman isn't playing against lefties that is that is happening right now yeah they do have three lefties each of the next two weeks so you really do need to consider but, that with james outman and like the thing to like you know keep in mind too is while chris taylor and eric and hernandez are not good anymore uh, they're well, they haven't well, been. Yeah, but like they neither of them like have options to like go down to a minor league. Yeah, exactly. And, and I was trying does. to jump yeah. your point there and agree with you that they're going to stick with them. Yeah, I I, I think they're they're kind of like legacy guys. Yeah, and I think it, I was even watching one of their games the other day, and the announcers were talking about how they had talked to Dave Roberts, and he said. I'm not t I'm not judging Chris Taylor off 40 plate appearances. At the time, they, I think they said 40. He has 48 right now. He has put up a historical track record with this organization that is way stronger than 40 plate appearances. So he's going to keep getting those opportunities. Outman is going to be a platoon guy. And in shower leagues, it's really hard to hold the strong side platoon guys, even if you like them. So while I'm an Outman guy, you're not. Even as the pro outman guy, I think you got to cut him in these three outfielder leagues. Yeah, you got to go get somebody so. else. Yeah, um, and I'm not going to go through names only because there's a ton. You got to kind of play the schedule and pick some names. When it's three outfielders, there's a lot of guys out there. So go look at the schedule. We got some seven game weeks. If you can get anything full on week Col in Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, actually, it's better. It's four games in Colorado, two in Mexico City, oh, which is Coors right. Plus. Those, those yeah. two Houston games are in Mexico City. So get any Rocky you can. Get your boy Sean Bouchard. I might actually spec Sean Bouchard for this week over James Outman, even in like a 10-team. Absolutely, yeah. Like take the Rocky that's available. Brenton Doyle. I know he got nicked. See what's up with him today in the lineup or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, go out and get somebody. I think you got to move on from Outman. But be ready to come back around on him for sure because he will get hot again, yep. and you'll want to be part of that, that uh, Dodgers lineup. This one, I didn't expect to have on the list, and maybe you'll tell me not to panic. I don't have many anywhere, so it's one I'm a little bit distanced from, but I feel like I might be looking to move on from Bryson Stott in the shower leagues, or is it just the 255 Babbitt? One homer, three steals, 16% K rate, 9% walk rate are right in line with last year's marks. In fact, the walk rate's up three points. Is it just a Babbitt situation that will correct itself? Or are there glaring signs here, you know, not striking the ball hard enough, et cetera, et cetera. Where are we at on Bryson Stott right now for shallow formats? There's definitely some concerning things. The exit velocities are down. The in-zone contact. I mean, he was like a 91% zone contact guy. Now he's, you know, like below league average at 83%. Mm -hmm. um, the average exit velocity, like you don't want to like overreact to the max exit velocity because, you know, yeah, one some hit. guys just had yeah, some guys just haven't had that one hit yet. But like yeah, the average exit velocity is down uh a fair amount right now. Uh, I I am a little concerned here. I I mean he is getting some pretty bad Babbitt luck. He was a you know 312 Babbitt guy last year, 294 for his career, and he's at 255. So like I do think the batting average should be better, but I also don't think this is what you drafted him. So yeah, exactly. Um, so are you making the move then in leagues that like don't have an MI and everything? 
Yeah, I think I could. Yeah, for sure. Like if if Edward Williams out there, yeah. even if Jonathan India like is out there, like again, yeah. like I said, like I think Jonathan India is a really good buy low right now because he's batting uh, higher in the good. Like they're both in good lineups, but give me the guy yeah. that's consistently batting higher batting right first, now. First, yeah. So what about Tyro? Neither of us really like Tyro coming into the year. He's got three homers. He's been whatever. You like him over Stock? Been, or you stick with he, Stock? So Tyro in the first week and a half of the season looked lost at the plate. Um, yeah. He has looked much better recently. Um, Does that so encourage you to go for him that, over Stock? That would encourage me to make that move. Uh, to I tend point, to not be so aggressive on, on guys like Stock because I, I just do think he's a very good hitter and I think he will yeah. figure it out. But like, if you're looking for a short short term bump, like I don't mind making that move. Yeah, in the last ten games for Tyro, nine thirty seven OPS with two homers, had a four thirteen OPS in those first thirteen. So like you said, kind of yeah. didn't know what he was doing at the plate, striking out a ton, which was uncharacteristic. Yeah, swinging way outside the zone on really bad pitches. Like it was, came out of it quickly yeah, like, because yeah, he's a solid player. He's had proven track, but so has Stott. Stott's yeah. shown some things already. So I'm inclined to want to hold but if you're really it's what i'm a i'm a little fence city on this one i want to be clear yeah, like, i can go either way with it if you're looking for that nudge to make the move and the right guys out there i get it don't t- kick him off of your watch list though keep him in your mind because once he gets hot i really want a guy i think 15 30. yeah i think it totally depends to what your team needs are right like if you yeah. drafted him for batting hours of stolen bases i'm probably just gonna hold um yep if you were just if you're just driving and, and kind of looking for the overall production, like I don't mind moving on and trying to see if I can get this somewhere else. It's hard to find thirty stolen. Like you can find stolen bases on the wire, but it's hard to find thirty stolen bases. And I think Th- thirty stock stolen bases be, that don't kill you too, like because he's going yeah. to eventually hit. Stott is so yeah. And he's I walking think more. Like maybe just as we've discussed it more, I think we're pushing further and further to just keeping him. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, hang on to stop where you can, maybe like an India scoop or something like that. Early victory lappers on Michael Garcia. I haven't heard much from them lately. And by the way, there weren't a ton out there. I'm just being <laughs> silly. I'm, one's uh, right here. One is right here. I like I was, Michael Garcia, so I'm not even anti. We were here. coming up with a rundown, and I was like, wait, why is Michael Garcia on this list? And then and I looked, like, I was like, oh, that's why Michael Garcia's on this list. Three homers, four steals. So you still mm-hmm. like the fantasy production, but it's coming with a 174 batting average. And sometimes it's hard to hold on to those counting stats while your average is being bludgeoned. Are we moving off of Michael Garcia? What are you seeing from your boy lately? Everything's fine. Everything okay. uh, above 90% zone contact. Uh, his XBA is like 257. Um, like he's still hitting the ball, you know, fairly hard, like just as hard as he was last year on an average basis. You know, the max exit velocity is a little bit lower, but again, all it takes is one hit and that's turned around. His barrel percentage is 12%. Ooh. Like there is nothing like Michael Garza. Here you go. You know, if someone's all like, Oh, I need to jump off. I got, you know, that, that first week was a fluke or something. And then you jump off. Like now's the time to go grab Michael Garcia. Like I, yep. Yeah. He, he was one of the big, we, what we did was I pulled up the roster trends for CBS and I looked at some of the biggest droppers, and Michael Garcia was being dropped in like twelve percent of the leagues where he was rostered. Uh, if you're in one of those leagues, go draw, go pick up Michael Garcia. Like I just, I agree, I zero zero concerns. I think it is exclusively the one eighty eight Babbitt. Yeah, some of these guys have had Babbitt issues that we've highlighted. Everything else is in place for Garcia. Literally yeah. everything. So yep, I I co sign that a hundred percent. Sticking with him, I don't know if I would co-sign a hold here. Now, we did see Jose Abreu come out of it a bit last year, um, I think a little bit down the stretch, and then had like five or six homers in the playoffs, which was kind of surprising. And I'm sure all of his fantasy managers were like, well, where the hell was that during the regular season, Jose? But um, it's it's rough, Justin. Let's just say that. Yeah, he did have a 760 OPS in the second half last year with 11 homers, which doesn't even sound that great, but it was a big jump from where he had been in the first half. But so far this year, he's hitting 068, nary a homer, but one ribby and six runs. It is horrendous. Are you holding a Abreu through this in shallower formats? Okay. So the BABIP is 0. 0.093. Casual 0. 0.093. Like that may be the worst BABIP I've ever seen in my life. Over like a 
you know, decent sample mm-hmm. of 65 point appearances. Like that's so bad. Pitchers so, have better bad than that. Yeah. So when I tell you that his 0. 0.068 batting average is not sustainable, his XBA is 115. Moving on up. <laughs> yeah. Which is still absolute garbage. Um, yes. You know how many barrels he has this season? I'm going to guess zero or one based zero. on you asking. Zero. Yep. Had, had to be. Zero had to barrel. be the Trivial Pursuit um, answer. I hate to say it, but I think Jose Bray was washed. I am worried I, he might be. I, you 37 know, like years old. Go ahead. He's he's making like league average zone contact. Yeah. But the ball doesn't go very far when he does that. No, like not literally zero, but like very few line drives. It's either on the ground or in the air, but like a a weak fly out, like a standard ish fly out in the air. He has an 18.8% hard percentage. That is, that is so bad. Like it's just, yeah, I I think he's washed. I think he should be dropped in every league. Yep. Uh, That's outside of AL only like. Yeah. Just because who are you going to get? Yeah, Jose Bray shouldn't be shouldn't be rostered. Yeah, I just I don't know what you're holding on for. Again, if he picks it up, you can come back. But I'm just not waiting this this out like, with Jose Bray. The Astros and the Astros see this coming. They're moving Joey uh, Laperfito, who's yes. one of their prospects from the outfield to first base right now in the minor leagues. He like, had a huge spring. There was even some talk of him making the team, but there was just no no real spot for him. So all he's done is gone down to AAA and hit 10 homers with 24 ribbies and a 1047 OPS. It, Joey Laperfito. If you can like pick up uh rookies or uh, or minor leaguers in your league before they get called up, that's a guy to spec on because I think he's going to be up before the end of the month. Agreed. L O P E R F I D O La Perfido. Looking pretty good, Joey La Perfido there. I do like that call out. And yeah, you got to move on from a brain. First base is like the easiest position to yeah. fix, too. A couple more guys here before you get, get you off for your chat. Uh, Mitch Carver, I'm talking one catcher leagues here. I understand if you want to stick in two catchers, but catchers so deep, I have a hard time holding one C leagues right now. I think I just want to get a better bat in there. Now, I will say it's not all horrible. I'm looking at a 5% homer to fly ball. That should fix. 211 Babbitt. 28% K, 13% walk, only one homer for Garver. Is he just in a cold spell that he's going to come out of, or is there issue? Is there uh, an issue here that you're concerned about with Mitch Garver? Um, Man, this one hurts because I, I was one of those people that was all like, hey, draft Mitch Garver. He's going to be the DH, and that'll help him stay healthy. Non-catching catcher. Non-catching catcher. Um. But the skills are really I don't think really you're degraded. wrong yet, though. I don't think I don't, you're wrong I don't yet. think I'm wrong yet. But like the skills have really degraded from what we saw last season. Um, True. In you know four percent lower on the zone contact. Uh, he's not hitting the ball hard. It's like the worst hard percentage of his career. Uh, he is putting the ball in the air. Maybe it's just too much. Um, like he's trying to lift things in a way in Seattle in uh, in the spring where. Like Seattle is a pitcher's park, and mm-hmm. in the spring it's even more difficult to hit home runs there. Maybe he's just like, I'm going to try to lift everything out, and that's just not working right now. So I think an approach change needs to happen uh, for Mitch Garver, and if we could see that, like he is definitely getting unlucky on balls in play. At 211 Babip um, isn't uh, isn't indicative of what he should be, but it's not like extremely unlucky. I think part of this is like these are just badly hit balls. Because yeah. his XBA is right in line with his batting average. Uh, it's a 160 XBA right now. So he kind of deserves the bad luck he's been getting. I think an approach change needs to happen. He does have a 19% infield fly ball rate, which tells me maybe he is just getting under things. Just missing. Just yeah. missing some pitches there. When you pop it straight up like that, that can be like your close. That being said, in a one-catcher league, like I'm not waiting around. That's the tough part. I would circle back. So again, I'll yeah. put Mitch Garver on the watch list if I'm cutting him, but I'm looking at Yahoo. Luis Comensano is 56%. Gimme. Yeah. Um, Elias Diaz, we just mentioned the big week yep. that Colorado has with the uh, Mexico City games. Gimme, yep. 34%. Travis Darno just coming off a three-homer yep. game. Gimme. Bo Naylor. Three-homer game on my DFS squad. So and I hot. still didn't you win. Did not. I st- you didn't win and you didn't sign up for any other big tournaments, right? 
No, I got third place in our tournament or in our in our little contest and didn't didn't put it anywhere else. But he pretty much carried my team. Like, yeah, I don't how know many that years I have I been kept. telling him to sign up for other leagues? I every usually time you do, do one, but I I struggled so much in DFS this year that I just, just in case. Yeah. Another name I'll mention by the way, Ryan Jeffers, thirty five percent rostered. Yeah. I'd rather him over Garver. So rather, a lot of options. You play you the hot handed catcher. Pick back up Garver after. Yes. Like if, Monitor Garver him. figures it figures it out. Things start to heat up in Seattle a little bit. Like he'll, I think he'll be okay eventually. But like totally right agree. now, in a one catcher league, in two catcher league, you're stuck. But in a one catcher yes. league, like go get one of those guys. Two catcher league, just sit tight, let it play out. One catcher, go find somebody else. Your boy, I don't know if you're gonna, you're purposely gonna mess up his name now because uh, Colt Keith, Keith Colt, whatever you want. He doesn't call him. deserve to be. That's what I'm saying, Colt Keith. But 183, 247, 197. It's been rough. But they signed him to the deal, which makes you think that he's going to get a little bit of a longer leash. I don't know if that's 100% certain, but I think it's a reasonable expectation. That said, can you and should you wait in the shallower formats on Colt Keith? What are you seeing from your boy and where you at? So I dropped him in my online championship this week. Okay. Um, or actually, no. Actually, I think did I drop him or Jared Trillo. I dropped one of them. Like, they're the same player I can't. Like, they're both second and third base eligible. I need to, like... Um, I I think he's going to be fine. His 90% zone contact is really, really good. 10% swing strike rate is fine. Um, he's putting the ball a little bit too much on the ground, but the XBA is 241. If he was in 241, we wouldn't be having this conversation. True. Um, so, like, he's still... Well, I think the concerning part to me is like the 17.5% or a hard percentage for Colt Keith. Um, that is a little bit concerning and zero home runs, zero home runs from a That's guy a who's bummer. supposed to be a power hitter. Um, I don't have a problem dropping him, but I also don't think this is going to be a long-term issue. I think he will turn it around. I think he's going to be okay. Maybe he's just not like, and again, I had this conversation uh, maybe it was Sunday with Jason we were talking about uh, Victor Scott the second, like, like there's a reason why like people don't want, like there's really smart people in the industry that don't like to draft prospects early on yep. in their career. It's because a lot of them don't succeed. We remember the ones that do. We always do. Exactly. Um, and we extrapolate it to everybody. And it's like, there's, there's a reason the term post hype sleeper exists, right? Yes. Because and you, you like, don't go broke fading prospects. Like, yeah, you can win getting them if you hit right, but you do not lose anything by exclusively fading them and focusing on now, guys with track records. That being said, like Cole Keith was not expensive, like right? No, in, in very most fairly drafts. priced. So, yep. Um, like I don't have a problem because, and, but this is the reason why. Like you need to be able to go. Okay, I'm willing to drop him now. Mm -hmm. because like he isn't succeeding like you should be able to like the hard part with prospects to go in like the fourth fifth round or you go like i'm not dropping him exactly uh, you know whereas i prefer to take games on guys like colt keith and i do have him on a number of leagues because i can't drop him and go move on to someone else and so like on my only championship i believe i did drop him so uh that being said like i think the underlying skills tell me he's going to be better uh and he just needs a, a little bit more time and I think the Tigers will give them that because, you know, Tigers, while they're they're competitive, I don't know that they're yes. competing. I think that's totally fair. And pitching is what's carrying them. They need the hitting yeah. to get better. And somebody like Colt Keith pretty much has to be part of that. If they have any designs on sneaking into this division and really sticking around all year, I think Colt Keith has to be a part of that. Like Torque's going to come around, I believe. And those two young guys with green – Carpenter and some of the veterans like uh like Canha. Well, I say some of the veterans plural as if there's more. It really is just Canha. Like I don't I don't love, you know, what Baez is gonna bring to the table. It really is a lot of young guys. So Meadows, Keith, Torque really need to be part of it. So they're gonna give him some time. Now it gets to a point where if he's hitting sub two hundred on Memorial Day, then I think you can give him a little clear your head trip back to triple A. But I think we're a couple weeks out from that. I really do think they're going to try yeah. to give. And watching him day out, day, day in, day out, anecdotally, I do think that Colt Keith isn't really that far off. 
Like you said, if he was hitting his 241 XBA, we wouldn't have even put him on the list. So yeah. you can stick with him, but in a shallow league where there's no middle, there's going to be options out there. Ride the hot hand and maybe come back to Colt Keith. So there you go. It is difficult to know when to make these decisions in shallow leagues. Great line from Scott Pianowski says that if you never make a bad move on one of these, if you never miss and, and cut somebody who ends up popping off, you're probably being too conservative, meaning you're just holding on to everybody just so that you don't get burned. You have to be comfortable making a quote unquote wrong move because it's not even necessarily wrong, right? Like if you cut Gorman for somebody and he ends up popping off two weeks down the line, that doesn't necessarily mean it was the wrong move. Process versus results. The process says time to move on. The results might come around the other way. So don't be afraid to make moves for fear that like, oh, I'm making the wrong decision. Um, you'll be paralyzed by that fear and you'll really struggle in the shallow leagues. So, all right, Justin, go do your chat. We will talk again on Thursday. And somebody brought up a great question in, in yeah. a comment uh, about talking about our daily process, just kind of what we go through to decide on lineups, what we're doing with our team. And we're going to discuss that on Thursday. So we will open the show with that. Uh, feel free to leave comments on the YouTube, on the mm -hmm. post of the uh, of the podcast, on Fangraphs, or on Twitter. And, if things and you this might want to topic discuss. was a suggested topic from somebody, I think, on Twitter. Uh, but uh, you see the posts on uh, or the, the comments on the posts on fan graphs. I see the comments on uh, the YouTube. So if you have things that, hey, like we're not discussing or we haven't discussed and you want us to discuss, just make sure you hit us up and then we'll we'll try to. Especially early. Thing. Yeah. Like because it's hard to have things, you know, because we don't want yeah, to cut you, a bunch you of came on. You came on to the, the, the program and you were all like, what do we talk about? I was like, what are we doing? Uh, oh, I don't I have an a idea. So, and we found one. So, yeah, yeah, we love suggestions. Feel free to send them to us uh, and we'll get it incorporated. So maybe we'll do a, a mailbag. We'll do a mailbag. That's actually a good idea. So especially uh, if it's like like. Um, strategy based too. I really yeah. like that. It's not so much just like, should I pick up or cut this guy? Mm -hmm. If it's more like, you know, how do you approach this or something like that? I love those debates and discussions. So you can, uh, you we'll can email me Justin Mason fantasy at gmail.com or hit us up on socials. I have a lot of Justin Mason fantasies. Wait, no, I don't. Yeah, I have to you go. Do. Goodbye. Have a good one. I'll talk to you later. Peace. Oh, wait, Take one thing, one thing, one oh, thing, one oh, thing. Oh, I want yeah. to talk about my my cool Chili Buns hat. This is yeah, from the is Wichita that? Surge. They they were the Wichita Chili Buns for a weekend um, with sponsor Bush, Bush Beans. And they sent me the hat and a t-shirt. And I just want to thank them for that. So oh, I, I didn't awesome. want to forget that. Very I'll cool. Take a hat. Hey, I like Bush Beans. Yeah, hey, maybe if the person who sent it to me is listening, he knew me through mm -hmm. OTP. Very kind. Thank you so much, Tim. All right. Talk to you later. Take it easy.